Gentlemen, how are you? It's so great to be with you. You know, I, I just come to, to Bayside to be built up and edified in Jesus. And my favorite subject gets discussed, farting in someone's mouth, <laughs> which has not happened to me, but which I've done to someone else. So it's just good to be with you in that regard, that we're all just really comfortable with our gas. And um, actually, it, 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 you know, when someone puts that in your brain, doesn't it spawn thoughts of other scenarios that you yourself were personally a part of? In fifth grade, we had a guy, literally, who could fart on command. His name was Gordy, and he was like a toy. We, we, would, we would say, Mr. Sievert, we have to go to the bathroom. Okay. And then the next guy would come, Mr. Sievert, we have to go to the bathroom. Of course, Gordy was waiting in the bathroom because we liked the acoustics of the John. It would just, and then at recess, we would catch fourth graders and have him fart in their mouths. So it was, he could literally, he would go back on his back and you would hear something go, and then he'd come back down and then off we go. So anyway... Just thought we'd start with that chapter of my life because it just, it's going to change yours. <laughs> it's going to change your life. Um, but really, it's good to be back in 49er country because, you know, I'm, there's no one who likes the thugs across the bay in here, are there really? Come on. I know, I know. My sister was a Raiderette when they went to, um, that was challenging, but um, yeah, my sister was a Raider, and I used to get free tickets to go to all the games, you know, Kenny Stabler and all those guys, but, you know, the Niners. Um, so, you know what it's like to have your 49th birthday, and you're a 49er fan? I'm going to show you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you. I want That's what it's like. Right there. Okay, so the backstory is my wife, who never flies the colors, right? I told her, like, uh, like it was coming up on my birthday, I'm like, honey... I swear to God, if you, like, ever wear anything 49ers, you know, forget the candles and the nice music. It, you, you know. So she, I mean, it's like, it's like George Costanza, you know, when he eats a sandwich and then is with a girl or, you know. Anyway, it's like he's combining his two passions, you know, food and women. Anyway, so I go to the restaurant on my birthday and my wife comes walking in, you know, and my daughter and I are there and, and, and like, she disappears. I'm like, where is she? It's like five minutes goes by. And all of a sudden, she comes walking out of the women's bathroom all in 49er gear, like in the bags, and she's got stuff on there. And, and I, I swear, I looked at her, and I just laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed. And I was like looking at her. She was looking at me, and all, my daughter's right there. She's a sophomore in high school, and she's like, you too. What's going on with you guys? But um, I went to the Seahawks game. That was not fun at all. I was so excited. Um, and the Niners, you know, I don't know, is anybody with me like when they go in the red zone and then Phil Dawson comes on the field, you know, the place kicker? I mean, are you as depressed as I am? I mean, anytime the guy with the soccer shoes comes on in the red zone, you're just like, that's an epic fail, bro. It's like, what are we doing, you know? And then the whole, like, Colin Kaepernick passes for 100 yards for three straight games. Anyway, um, but you know, that Seahawks game, they set a world record for decibel level. You have ne I mean, there's people with, with earplugs in their ears, and then every time the 49ers got the ball, it would be, ah, like, I'm like, what is this, hell? You know, it's like, what's going on? And... Um, it's no mistake, you know, they have the most false starts there, and between the fans and the 40, you know, the Seahawks are pretty decent, and the noise and the false starts, I mean, it's like first and goal on the five, up oh, penalty, first and goal from the 20, up oh, penalty, first and goal from the 35, pretty soon it was like first and goal from the 50-yard line, and, um, but, you know, why? Now, 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 now I'm getting serious, but why? Why? The red zone, why did the decibel level go up so high? Because breaking that plane is everything. It's everything. In that arena, it's not breaking that plane is everything to the defense. Breaking that plane 
uh, is everything to the offense. And you know what sucks as a guy? Being bogged down in your own red zone as a man. You know, maybe it's a breakthrough in a marriage that started off strong but now has faded into a coexistence. And being bogged down there, unable to kind of move the ball, you know, early on you move the ball down the field and and then you get to this place and it's like you're just stuck there and it's like continuous field goals and you're never going to go to the next level or, or maybe it's your connection with God. You know, you started off on fire and it was this awesome thing. Or maybe you, maybe you came to Christ when you were young and it was just like, oh, Jesus was so real. And then you drove the length of the field and all of a sudden you're just like, ugh. You're just like bogged down and, and your, your spirit is dry and your soul is parched. And, and, and your relationship with God isn't, isn't really working the way it used to. And you wonder if you'll ever score you know, kind of in that realm of your life. Again, maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's just your single guy. And, and you know, it's just like this, this sexual purity thing is just so hard. Or maybe you're single again. And you didn't expect that. And then all of a sudden, it's just like, oh, I'm, I'm bogged down in this red zone. And, you know, there's this trillion-dollar marketing universe out there. So you, don't have to, you don't have to chase sex. Sex chases us, guys, in our culture. It finds you. You know, everywhere, whether you're driving down, you know, Golf Links Road and it's a jogger or whether it's a spam on your computer or whatever, and, uh, or maybe it's just your thought life. You're kind of bogged down there and you just can't escape, you know, a way of thinking. Maybe you're depressed. I don't know what your red zone issue is, but what I'd like for us to do, because I have mine, what I'd like for you to do just in the privacy of your own head is to think, wow, where in my life would I love to go from the red zone to the end zone? You know the difference, right? Frustration, elation. Depression, celebration. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is really, really simple. Because you know what? I need you to go from the red zone to the end zone. I need Paul Pettit, Jeff Genoway, uh, Hans Schroeder, Bob Belanger and Jeff Mallory. Those are the five guys. Those are my red zone friends. And you know what they do in my life? They help me go from these these red zones where I get bogged down and where I stall. And as I grow older and as my relationships mature, as my challenges change, as my career moves one way, they are in my life to throw a block for me and spring me from the red zone to the end zone, and then we dance and we celebrate together, but it costs them. It costs them. It costs them time. It costs them, you know, confronting me. It costs them, you know, sometimes they feel like it's going to cost us our friendship at some junctures because I want to win. I want to progress. And it's just like my job in helping my kids, you know, make strong choices, have to be strongly connected to me so that, you know, I can build honesty in their lives and perseverance in their lives and consistency and integrity and unity of purpose. But I have to be given permission in their lives and authority or else it doesn't work as their dad. Same thing with us. Same thing with you right around these tables. Same thing with all men around the world because there are consequences to the company we keep. Amen? There's consequences to the company we keep. And the the destinations that we reach a lot of times just have to do with our affiliations in our first circle of friends. And what are the nature of those? See, I read in Men's Health that the, the, the ways that guys connect most with their buddies, first is texting, second is get togethers. Okay? Like we get together. So we'll hobby, we'll golf, we'll go motorcycle riding, we'll have a barbecue, we'll, we'll make things run for their lives and kill them, all right? We'll do that. We'll get together. But here's the deal. What are we doing when we're getting together? Because here's, here's my, my theme for tonight. A lot of guys are winning battles of appearances while at the same time they're losing the battles of life. Winning the battle of appearances while losing the battles of life, the real ones, the ones we're measured by when we go in the casket, 
okay? Quality of relationships, relationship with God, service, impact. The things that people talk about, not our vacations, not our toys, not how many, how many drivers we had in our bag. That's not what we're measured by. So here we are, winning the battle of appearances, losing the battles of life, and then as God's men, let's go to the next level. We're the ones who God has called to lead our churches, our families, our kids, our nation, our communities, our countries, 700 million of us. And God is calling us worldwide. Let me just tell you, going all, this meeting right here is just a microcosm of a movement that's going on outside of it where God is calling his sons back and he's bringing new team members into the fold. Let me just say this. If you're here and you're checking this out, you're not here by coincidence. I do this a lot, and I say this a lot. The Bible says that the mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You might have been asked by your buddy like to go to the grocery store, and you ended up at Bayside. <laughs> but despite his deception, no, you're here because God wants to meet with you right now. So here's what I'm going to talk about. If that's the issue, if we're winning the battle of appearances and losing the battles of life, as men, I mean, think Petraeus, think Tiger Woods, you know, think about these celebrity guys, you know, it's, it's, you know, these apex predators, you know, they have it all. Some guys go hunt bad guys for a living, and then we find out that he was an iceberg and he was presenting the tip while underneath the, in the battles of life, he was losing. Then you got a guy who's sinking 30-foot putts for a million dollars a couple years ago, and his wife almost kills him with an eight iron, leaving his house in Florida. He's losing the battles of life, and yet we excuse him. We just go, you know, whatever. But hey, that's just a reflection of what's going on in millions of lives. And look up here. Want to know Why? Because it's a spiritual battle in the lives of men. You have been given by God a mantle of leadership that women do not have. And that's not politically correct, I know. <laughs> Especially in the People's Republic of California. All right? Sorry, I leaked. Uh, but here's the deal. There is a spiritual battle. You know who's... Who's Satan is attacking by who's missing? And in the church, I mean, the women, they're all there. The kids are all there. The church has their energy and their expression. But I tell you what, there's a sleeping giant, and you guys, this is just so amazing. You guys are a part of the sleeping giant that's just going to rise and, and, and really knock it out of the park. So we're friends, right? So let's talk truth, all right? The Bible says this. In Proverbs chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, it says, So, join the company of good men. All right? Join the company of good men. Keep your feet on tried and true paths. It's the men who walk straight who will settle this land. The women of integrity who will last here. The corrupt will lose their lives. The dishonest will be gone for good. The Bible says this too. Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Now, let's, let's work in. That's red zone friendship, isn't it? Okay? That's men with a goal, men sharpening, men walking together, walk with the wise, become wise. I'll tell you, I was so stupid in so many ways until I, I added Jesus to the team. And if you're here and you're checking Jesus out, highly recommend for your, for your team, number one draft pick. Get him on board, all right? Because he will ruin the old guy that sabotages your best intentions, and he will raise up a new guy who makes way better decisions. But secondly, I added so many new brothers in Christ that, that took me to levels that I never thought I could reach, ever. It's like, there's no way I... But with their help, they got me there. So our theme tonight is don't get bogged down in the red zone. Every guy's got to have red zone friends. So what are the, the keys to your red zone friends? And if you're sitting here and you're going, you know what, I don't got one of those. That's okay. You're in the right spot. But we're going to look at five keys to how men should be doing life, how the world needs us to be doing life, and how much suffering will go down in the world if we choose to do life this way. And the first key is transparency. Say transparency. 
The first key is transparency. You know, it's, it's that whole thing that I was talking about earlier about, hey, we're winning the battle of appearances but losing the battles of life. And part of the reason why is because we don't like talking about the areas that ruin our image. We project out there, all right, listen, I'm the last of seven, Navy brat, raised in uh, an Al-Qaeda cell of five brothers. <laughs> I know about the whole I'm self-sufficient, keep your, your bootstraps, play the tough guy, that whole thing, all right? It's fine when you're on the playground. It's fine on the football field maybe, but it does not work when you grow up because you're just not that tough and you're just not that strong. And you're just not full of all that character that you need to meet the demands of reality and the pressures and the spiritual attack against your soul. And part of the reason why is because we just don't come out with the people that God has put in our lives, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's no reason for you to keep secrets. But you know who has a big stake in your secrets? The devil. Because he knows that as long as you're keeping secrets, your character will get sick. If your character gets sick, it will result in sick conduct and sin, which will lead to broken relationships with God and people. Go ahead. Project that image. Keep your secrets. Because Satan knows the devastation that will be created. When at our disposal is God himself and the people of God that are supposed to bring us to new levels and execute. And yet it's just our fear and pride, amen? It's just our fear and pride. We just can't get honest because of our fear that, oh, I'll be exposed. Or our pride, like, you know, I, I, just, I, I just, you know, I'm stubborn, I'm sorry. Meanwhile, that's stupid because then our problems go unresolved because we can't talk about them and we can't get help and so we're just bogged down in the red zone forever. So that's the first key to red zone friendship. The way God wants us to live in this hour, we gotta start getting transparent. And hey guys, let me just tell you, in business, I demand it. If we're gonna do a deal, I want transparency. You gotta, I wanna know you, I wanna know about your company, I wanna know whatever that is. We demand transparency. We demand transparency in other dealings, whether you're fixing a car or the plumber comes over, we want transparency. How much is it gonna cost? What are you gonna do? So we know about the value that transparency gives us confidence moving forward. The Bible says this, he who conceals his struggles will not prosper, but the man who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. That's what the wisest man who ever walked the planet after Jesus, Solomon, said in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. But do you get the picture? You conceal, you stagnate. You reveal, you find compassion, and here's the lie, here's the myth. If I, if, I, if I reveal, I will be rejected somehow, which is just a lie that plays into your pride and fear. The big breakthroughs in my life was when I had my men's group, and I said, guys, I'm 50 grand in debt. I'm driving an expensive German sports car. That just a tranny just came out of that. I maxed out on my credit cards. This whole deal is going down. I need help. I'll never forget that moment. Vice president of a company, big deal. Never talked about what was really going on in the home. My home was incinerating every 30 days when the bills came due, and yet I had the 2.5 children, the Labrador, I had the Suburban, I had the fancy German sports car. My life was crumbling in the middle of it, but I didn't talk about it until it was almost the pain was greater than my fear of talking about it, right? And, that, that, and then finally it's like, okay, I'll tap out. Because there was nowhere else to go. But if I, had, if I had been more transparent on the front end, just go, hey guys, you know what? I need some help with, with some of these decisions. But you see, there was a part of me that was so afraid and so stupid, played right into the devil's hands. But when I went to my guys and I told them this big thing that was going on that I was walking around with thinking about, man, did the breakthrough start coming? Because we had some great guys who'd been where I'd been, knew what to do. It was great. The Bible says this, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And, and just talks about, just you know what? Everybody's going through the same thing. 
Nobody's going to be surprised. And newsflash, we already kind of know something's up. Why not just get honest? And that's the key to red zone friendship. You've got to have honesty and transparency. The second key is you've got to have proximity. Say proximity. Proximity, yeah. I've got to be honest, but I've got to be close to you. Not, not like, hey, bro, how's it going? Saul Good. Who's this guy, Saul Good? Who is he? Who is he? You know, it's like, like some Jewish nice guy or something. You know, it's like, what's going on, bro? Saul Good. No, it can't be good. This is earth. The Bible I read says it's broken and there's, my heart's evil and, you know, I, I go toward the wrong things. The very thing I want to do, I hate. It's all good. Well, there are good things, but, you know, life's not like peaks and valleys. I think life is more like railroad tracks. Like, while there's good going on, there's also probably some bad things going on. At the same time, the good's going on. So it'd never be all good because, you know, it's earth. It's not heaven. But then when we think it's like all bad, oh, the sky's falling. No, there's some blessings and things that we can be grateful for. And, you know, we just got to get make our peace with that. But I have to be close to you. I have to see you. I have to be close to you. I have to be close enough to inspect. That's why when the Bible says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, it's not two swords going, ping, you know, like the razor blade commercial back in the day. You know, that's not it. It's not tungsten steel. It's a sharpening stone and a blade. Aluminum oxide, diamond plated steel up against the metal. And the blade that is now previously dull is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And maybe it's on a grinding wheel and the sparks are flying. Is that how your friendships work? Do they create sparks? Does it get a little hot? Do your, do your friendships give you a little fever? They should in order for you to be sharp so that you can perform. It's like the Ronco commercial. It cuts, it slices, it dices, it even makes julienne fries. You know, the Ginsu peeler. But you gotta have a guy that has not just your transparency, but you gotta let him get close enough because if your friends don't sharpen you to your goals, guess what they're doing? They're dulling you. He goes, you want a uh, smoking marriage connected to your wife? You got to get honest about it, and you got to get close to another guy who you respect, who's headed the same way. You're a single dude. You're young here. You want to be sexually pure? You want to be God's man? You want to stand in a culture that wants to take you down? You got to get next to another godly young man or a godly single guy, and you need to sharpen each other and encourage each other. The Bible talks about how David was looking for these iron men to sharpen his blade so that he could perform as a leader. It says, my eyes will be on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. Say, dwell with me. Dwell with me. So that they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. Say, minister to me. So, dwell with me. Minister to me. That's what you need. Proximity. I have to be close enough to you. I have to, I have to get honest and I have to have you in my life and you got to be close enough to see me. If you're here and you're not connected to a small group, some kind of small group, good luck with that. You know how lions hunt, right? They get, got, they get the, the herd running around. Then the poor cape buffalo or antelope or zebra that gets disconnected, then they focus on that, then they take it down, and then they have dinner, right? The Bible says that we need to be sober, be alert, your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring, what? Lion, seeking someone to devour. And so if you're here tonight, and you don't have a red zone friend, and if you're not honest with anybody in your life about what's really going on, and they're not close enough to see you and to see the real struggles that they can help you with, good luck with that. On the other hand, if you're here and you're going, man, I need that, stay tuned. The third key to red zone friendship and moving from the red zone to the end zone in whatever area that you, talked, you thought about in your mind is frequency. Say frequency. Okay, so we got three things so far. Transparency, proximity, okay, that's closeness. So we have honesty, closeness, and then frequency, okay? The Bible is very clear. 
It says if you're going to hold on to your convictions and your commitments, you must meet with other believers to maintain those convictions and commitment. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, okay? All right, I'm in, you in? Let's hold to our hope, all right? Our best intentions, our best desires to be the best men that we can possibly be. Leave a footprint on planet Earth before we go. Love God, love people, love our wives. Walk in integrity. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. It goes on and says, for he who promised is faithful. Okay, I'm all in. How do we do that? And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Here's the key. Not giving up meeting together. Say meeting together. You want to hold on to your convictions? You want to be the best man that you can be? You want to be the best husband, best man of God, best dad, best friend, best employee, best boss? You can't give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, we got this sense that, you know, when this happens, then I'll get tight with some dudes. When my life slows down, I'll, I'll develop these connections Kenny's talking about. When this happens, then I'll do that. That when and then thinking, you know who that's sponsored by? This message is brought to you by Lucifer himself. <laughs> when this happens, perfect conditions do not exist. And Satan loves, when we love, perfect conditions having to exist that makes it emotionally easier for us to pursue the things God commands. Not because he's a killjoy or wants to make you uncomfortable or put people up all in your business. It's because he knows that's how you're going to get better. Because he knows how it works. So that's what the Bible says. So we have transparency, proximity, frequency. Now, this is real friendship. I'm not talking about the kind where it's just like, hey, buddy, how's it going? Praise the Lord. See each other at church once a month. I mean, even this. It's hard to get close to dudes in a crowd this big. That's why we got to go to the next level. The next key to red zone friendship and going from red zone to end zone, whatever that is, after frequency is unity. Say unity. See, the Niners, teams, your favorite teams, whatever, they can be together, meaning they can have the same uniform, they get paid out of the same bank account, they show up on the field, they snap the ball, they move. Wouldn't you agree there's a big difference between being together as a team and being unified? I mean, think Trojans, okay? I'm a UCLA fan, so if we were in Southern California, that would be funny. But... <laughs> Now, they're getting unified. I, I was so mad when they fired Lane Kiffin. They were so not unified. Now, Ed, Ed O, Ed Orgerin, the new, the new interim coach, he's a master. You know what he did? He marched everybody out to the Coliseum in the front. He said, players, I want you to bring your families. We're going to get in a circle, and we're going to bring a pastor in. I'm gonna pray. I, I have to love Coach Ogren at, at, uh, at USC now. But he brought them all in. He got them unified. He got them rallied. And there's a difference between being together and being unified. The Bible says this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement, encouragement from being united with Christ. Say that with me. United with Christ. It starts there. We serve the same king. We're in it together. We're charged to be men of God and leaders in Christ and in his character, in the world, in our context, in this hour. But we have to come together, and then when we're together, we have to get really unified. The passage goes on in Philippians chapter 2. It says, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, say like-minded, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. You know what? When I see a team that's one in spirit, of one mind, operating out of the same playbook, executing, people knowing their roles and just saying, your success is my success, and your success is my success, and my success is your success, and I'm here to sharpen you. And guess what? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to stay close to you. I am your, one of your best friends. We're going to get together. I'm going to make sure you succeed. And when we get into that red zone moment, I'm going to throw a block for you, 
I am going to hand you the ball. I'm going to do my part to make sure that you go from here to here. That's what the Bible is talking about. So if we're united with Christ, and it starts there, just being united with Christ, then the charge is this, that we think the same, that we help each other, that our spirits are the same, that we're for each other, and that we're one in spirit and mind. The Bible says in Psalm 133, it's this awesome, beautiful picture of the power of red zone friends. It says this, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And then it paints this picture. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Let me, let me tell you what this means. It's a picture of two men, the oil coming over one man is symbolic of the presence of God. They had this oil in Moses and Aaron's time. It's called the oil of the presence. And so when two men consecrated each other, there would be the oil of the presence, and it was this very precious, precious thing that there was this bond between two guys, and when the mantle was being passed from one man to another, they would take the oil of the presence, and that's why they talked about it flowing down Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe, it's a symbol of God's presence. And then it brings into this, this, this discussion pictures of mountains. There's a taller mountain, Mount Hermon, and then there's the smaller mountain, Mount Zion. And it's as if the dew of Mount Hermon is falling onto Mount Zion. And then what does the Bible say when that's happening? When there's God in common, when there's guys getting together in common, there's transparency, proximity, frequency, there's unity of spirit. In God, in Christ, what happens? Say this with me. For there, the Lord bestows his blessing. You're being blessed right now just by being here. God delights when his sons come together. And they start looking to him, and they start worshiping, and then they start looking to one another. And they look to God, and they look to one another, and they're for each other, and they're convicted, and they want to sharpen each other. And it's like the oil of the presence. What dad isn't stoked when his sons come together, and they're reflecting the best parts of his character? Every dad is stoked. But you see, the devil, if that's where God's power and presence is, when men come together in unity... Now we have Satan's number one mission against the church and against the body of Christ. Hey, let's make men affiliated attenders, not activated members. Let's have them get all their significance in the world, show up at church with the family because it's a good thing, okay? But let's keep them in the audience, not in the army, okay? Let's not bring them together. That's why this church, it's on you. You have an anointing on your church. This meeting right here is an oxymoron. Keyword, moron. <laughs> Only a moron wouldn't want this. This is awesome. Why? Because God's blessing is here forevermore, the Bible says. When two men come together, and it doesn't mean it's a big meeting, but after we leave, you need to get connected in a small group and keep that blessing going. All right, so let's, let's review. Say Transparency. Proximity, frequency, unity. Last key, and this is the biggest one. Say authority. Okay, now that's the kicker. When a man has authority in your life to tell you something and you respect him for telling you. The Bible talks about this in the book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verses 5 and 6. It says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy, get this, multiplies kisses. You got a bunch of friends around you just, oh, you're great. Oh, yeah. If that's only the friends you have that agree with you and there's no conflict ever, that's not a friend. A real friend, occasionally, not all the time, otherwise he wouldn't be your friend. 
occasionally, we'll just go, you know what? How's it going in that, you know, with the whole lust thing? How's it going, you know, at your school, in your class? If you're a young guy and you're here, how's it going with your parents? Do you respect your parents? You know? If you're a married guy, how's it going with, with, with Chrissy, Kenny? How are you guys doing? You know, Greg was back there. He wasn't busting my balls. He's not farting in my mouth either. But he was asking me a question. He said, how are you, how, how are you in the family doing? How, no, I could see in his eyes. It's like, you know, where it's just kind of like, okay, we're getting past the niceties. I'm stepping through. You know, I know you're you and you're about to go speak. But you know what? Greg and I have known each other for a, a good number of years. And he just goes, hey, how are, how are the kids? How are you in the family? How are you really doing? I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Because then I said, you know what? I told him. I said, I'm the billion dollar guy. My wife loves me. We're growing. Not everything's perfect, but we're tight. You know, we're, we're together. Kids are good, you know. Um, but, you know, he has authority to do that in Christ. And I let him do that. But you know what happens when you don't have someone who has authority in your life to get up in your business? I'll tell you. I just made some notes before I came in. Your influence starts to exceed your character. That's a biggie. You know, when, as a man, we have influence automatically, whether it's good or bad. We have a zone that we create in our character, all right, and our character is expressed in conduct, but no, if nobody's checking on our character and our character goes unchecked, no bueno. We need people to check our character and to get in our zone. You also begin to become more synthetic as a leader because you're all in your own juice, right? Nobody's checking on you. So you believe, you know, like Clint Eastwood says, you're a legend in your own mind, you know, and it's all great. And you become more synthetic and less authentic, okay? Begin to lose perspective on yourself versus gain perspective on yourself. You become very vulnerable because you're okay by yourself, you don't need other people, that's the most vulnerable guy of all. You know what the greatest weakness is? A guy who says he has no weaknesses. That's the greatest weakness. You open yourself up to manipulation because people tell you what you want to hear versus what you need to hear. Authority, a last word on authority. It's from the man after God's heart, David, in Psalm 141, five, says this. <laughs> this is the UFC verse of friendship. Let a righteous man strike me. That is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. There's that, there's that picture, oil, right? The presence of God coming through accountability and sharpening and not just everything I want to hear. So, hey, if you're here and you're a son and you're here with your dad and he gets up in your business... That's this verse. You know, if you're a little younger, just know that when a dad comes into your life and he steps in and, and he says, hey, that's not going to work for me around here. And it doesn't work for our family. You know, he's actually helping you. Uh, the verse goes on. It says, my head, where the oil goes, will not refuse it, for my prayer will still be against the deeds of evildoers. And so the context is good doing or evil doing, but you need a man in your life, you need a red zone friend that has authority. That's how we should think about a man of authority. Better is open rebuke than love that's concealed. Faithful are those wounds. My, my brother-in-law is in town. He lives in Folsom. He's the number one surgeon in Northern California, voted by his peers. 4,000 other surgeons said, this is the guy that I want to cut on my mother. That's my brother-in-law. So, you know, his name's Chris Swanson. He's in town. You think about him, pray for him. He's got a big job. But, you know, at Christmas time, a very weird thing happens. His office begins to fill up with crystal, salami, cracker barrel, gifts, fruit baskets. And you know who's sending him these things? People he took a scalpel on and he cut into their body and he repaired something and he left a scar. Who else gets fruit baskets and champagne and, and, and crystal for cutting on a person? My brother-in-law does. Want to know why? Because these people are so grateful that he cut on them. Not a stab to kill, but a cut to heal. Say cut to heal cut to heal. Who's, 
Who's your red zone friend who has authority in your life to leave a mark? And it's a cut to heal. There have been a few times in my life where I wanted to lose the very friends that decided to wheel me into the OR and cut on me. And it wasn't, I remember one time, man, it was not like a scalpel, it was like a thoracic saw. I mean, it's just like, hey, here's Kenny's heart. Why don't you catch it? You know, and they're just, but man, I tell you, I remember after that, if they hadn't intervened at that moment, it would have been bad news just in my life. I, I could see, part of me saw what they were saying, and I was just going, ooh, you know what? You're right. So, you want to go from the end zone to the red zone? You want to go from, from stagnation in a certain area of your life to real results? You want to go from secrecy to openness and, and freedom? You want to go from sickness of character to recovery and healing? The way that you get there is by having red zone friends, by having men of God in your life, adding Jesus to the team, and then adding God's men to your team to get you there. It says this in Hebrews 12. It's a cool picture. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. You know, the picture is of a sprinter and economy of effort. Okay, those guys don't run in parkas, all right? They run with liberty and freedom, and they got little things from Nike or Reebok or whatever, but they lightest shoes, light, light, light. You want your life to be lighter? Then you need people cheering you on, and that's the picture that we're talking about. You need red zone friends around you, and, and it feels like they're stretching you. There's a question. Who's stretching you? If your sons, your dad's job is to stretch you, to move you from boy to man. If you're older, you need a man in your life to stretch you and not always make you feel comfortable and ask you questions. And he has authority in your life. The Bible says it. And that's where I'm going to close here before we go to discussion. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, it's talking about the stretching. And it's the Apostle Paul, and he's talking to the Thessalonian believers, and he says, hey, we instructed you... Verse 1, chapter 4, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, all right? And then he says this, as in fact you're now living. So everything's going okay, all right? Timothy went, checked on the Thessalonians, faith, A, love, A. The report card was great. But then he says this, now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus. Say, in the Lord Jesus, in the Lord Jesus, to do this more and more. Say more and more. More and more. So it's like, okay, um, I affirm your progress, but I'm not letting you stay where you are, stay comfortable. I'm focused on the next phase of your growth. You're doing good here, faith, A, love, A. But you know what my job is? It's not to make you feel comfortable. It's to stretch you, and I don't need an invitation, and I don't need a crisis to speak up in your life. That's a true friend. That's a true friend. And you know what, guys? Here's the thing. Yeah, but he's not like me. Yeah, but I got to risk knowing people that aren't, you know, like me. Hey, you know what? Just think clownfish and an enemy. They have a mutually beneficial relationship. They are dramatically different creatures. But they have this, this symbiotic connection that kind of makes it work. And you know what, men? We're dissimilar creatures. Amen? I don't fart in your mouth. Okay, Kurt, maybe, I don't know. But we're mysteriously and spiritually connected and created by God to help each other. Win, not just settle. And you know what? The world is waiting for our team to rise. Men of God in the church. And I'll tell you what, traditional masculinity, you know, the broken male kind where it's all about sexual conquest, possessions, and power, that's been rejected by the world. But so is Omega Male. You know the soft, wimpy guy feminists created who irritates them? Okay? He's been rejected too. You know who they're looking for? They're looking for a combination of strength and emotional maturity. They're looking for compassion and commitment. They're looking for sacrifice and service. You know who they're looking for? They're looking for Jesus. They're looking for Jesus. 
in you. But you're not going to get there unless you're connected to other men who love Jesus and who are becoming like Jesus. And that's what the beauty of this thing is. So if you're here for the first time, please come back. If you're a regular here, please come back. Greg's going to talk about getting connected. There's a movement in this church. And the pastors of this church need you to activate. They don't want you in the audience. They want you in the army. But they got to get you connected and healthy first. They got to get you doing life. They can't, they can't come to every house and sit down and have Starbucks with you and go, so how's your marriage? How's your... That's your job. You need to be doing that with each other. All right, we're going to do some talking. And before you get out to go to the bathroom, look up here. The person with the biggest stake right at this moment as we go to discussion is the devil. And I'll tell you why. Because if we talked about transparency, you know what? The more honest you guys are when we go to discussion, I'm going to give you just a blue dot softball. You know, just push. All right? No problem. You can talk about this stuff. But Satan would love for you to just stay stuck and bogged down in your red zone of fear and in your red zone of pride, you know, skim the surface but not reveal too much when you could tonight have a breakthrough.